Welcome back to my list of 50 retired Sesame Street Muppets. Now the last video I had had a rather lengthy introduction, I'll admit, but now that we've gotten all the ground rules and all the, uh, the prefacing out of the way, we can just jump right back into the list, so let's start. Number 11, Calambo, performed by Joey Mazzarino. Columbo was, of course, a parody of the long-running detective show Columbo, about a detective who more or less played dumb to get criminals to let their guard down. I will say, though, that Columbo's actor Peter Falk did make a memorable cameo in The Great Muppet Caper. Columbo was a lamb detective who primarily investigated nursery rhyme-based crimes, like figuring out that Jack Horner had stolen a plum from a pie. Other times, he appeared on Sesame Street solving the characters' dilemmas. One of his most memorable cases involved helping Nick Chicken, hilariously played by Kevin Kline, find his adopted sister Nora Chicken, who had disappeared. Another case had everyone begin braying like sheep, with only Columbo being able to translate. As far as Muppet detectives went, Columbo was better at his job than, say, Sherlock Hemlock, but let's be real, that's not saying too much. While Columbo did solve some cases on his own, other times it was dumb luck, like when he helped find Oscar's missing elf and Fluffy, who happened to show up behind Maria and Gabby just as Columbo was questioning them. In regards to the missing Nora chicken case, it was actually Telly Monster who came up with an idea on how to find Nora, not Columbo. Oh, and one more thing. Columbo is very important to his performer, Joey Mazzarino, who was a longtime writer of Sesame Street, and even the head writer for seasons 40 to 46. His audition script was where Columbo originated. Number 12. Countess Darling von Darling, performed by Brian Meal. There have been several countesses over the years, many of them being romantic partners for the Count. Countess von Darling, however, was the Count's fifth cousin and only appeared in season 12 of the show, watching the Count's castle while he was away taking care of business in Transylvania. The Muppet Wiki describes his business as a counting emergency, whatever the heck that is. The Countess is always accompanied by her dachshund Masha, performed by Karen Prell, who helps her remember certain numbers. The most notable aspect of the Countess is what happens when she finishes counting. The Count, of course, is accompanied by the sound of thunder and flash of lightning. The Countess is accompanied by a downpour, even indoors. For this reason, people seemed to dread her counting in a few appearances. To my knowledge, no one's ever been struck by the Count's lightning, but rain indoors is a bit much. Ironically, in her final known appearance, the gang wanted her to count to make rain for some plants. Adding to the irony, the Countess mistakenly believed that Masha had a cold and left halfway through her counting, not even letting it rain at all. We can only assume that when the Count returned from his emergency, the Countess and Masha left, for once, a plot-relevant reason to why a character stopped appearing. Number 13, Cousin Monster, originally performed by Bob Payne. Different seasons of Sesame Street have had different curriculums in focus. Season 36 in 2005, for example, focused on healthy eating. One promoted song was sung by Hoots the Owl to Cookie Monster called A Cookie is a Sometimes Food. Despite the title of the song, Cookie Monster did still eat a cookie afterwards. Around the same time, Grover appeared on Jimmy Kimmel Live to promote a DVD called Healthy Happy Monsters, and innocently ad-libbed a joke about Cookie Monster going on a diet. The combination of these two events opened the floodgates for the press. A long-standing rumor quickly began that Cookie Monster was off sweets for good, and was even changing his name to Veggie Monster. This was all untrue, of course, never mind the fact that Cookie Monster had already taught kids about healthy choices in songs and PSAs as early as 1974. The funny thing is, one of Cookie's family members was already technically a Veggie Monster. Making her debut in 1979, Cousin Monster bewildered Cookie Monster when she showed no interest in sweets, but was delighted by Ernie's grocery bag of vegetables. I've only been able to find two sketches with this adorable tyke, but she's quite charming, and I think that bringing her back would be a good move. Outside of her appearances as Cousin Monster, the puppet was used as Cookie Monster's sister during his inspirational song, Me Gotta Be Blue, and as a shoulder angel in Don't Eat the Pictures. It's funny how an innocent joke and a song about moderation spawn an urban legend that refuses to die. To this day, Sesame Street writers and characters affirm that Cookie Monster is still Cookie Monster. I suppose it's kind of comforting that Cookie has built up such a fan base who love him just the way he is. And wherever his cousin is, I hope she's enjoying some nice carrot sticks. Number 14, Dina and Pearl, performed by Karen Prell and Brian Meal. Dina and Pearl, with Dina in particular, is a nice example of a well-intentioned idea gone wrong. According to longtime Sesame Street writer Norman Stiles, while it is now understood that play is an important part of a child's brain development, it wasn't promoted as much in the 80s. For season 11 in 1980, a reddish monster named Dina was introduced to stress the importance of play. 
For Dina, playing is akin to what cookies are to Cookie Monster, or counting is to the count. In the following season, Dina was redesigned into a purple, googly-eyed monster. In addition, her caretaker, Pearl, was introduced. It was unclear as to what their specific relationship was, but they were definitely not mother and daughter. Four known sketches were filmed in the monster's cave-like dwelling, where Dina would pester Pearl into playing with her. Dina, it's not time to play. It's time to go to sleep. Ugh. Any time time to play? In the meantime, Dina would appear out on Sesame Street itself, interacting with the usual characters. So why did Dina and Pearl not make the cut after Season 12 ended? In the words of Norman Stiles, Dina's insistence on playing was more annoying than endearing. Having watched a few Dina sketches, I couldn't agree more. While only one Dina and Pearl sketch is available online in English, the rest are foreign dubs, it's just not terribly funny or engaging, and instead feels like a knockoff Ernie and Bert routine. I could only find two other Dina appearances, one with Maria and one with Olivia, and neither of them were that interesting, although Olivia did have a nice song in one of them at the very least. Not counting her four sketches with Pearl, Dina appeared in two dozen episodes of Sesame Street, many of which are not available online or on DVD. However, having read the descriptions of the scenes and seeing Dina in action a few times, I can safely assume we're really not missing much. Thankfully for Karen Prell, a few years later she performed a much more likable character who was also obsessed with playing, Red Fraggle. Number 15, Dexter, performed by Kevin Clash and Fred Garbo. In an episode from season 17, Big Bird and Snuffy investigate a mystery. Various objects, all of them round, are disappearing on Sesame Street. Eventually, they track down the culprit, a large purple monster named Dexter, who's borrowed the items to juggle with. Dexter loved juggling, and that was about it. He was quite talented and assured the others that he could stop anytime, he just didn't feel like it. While you might be thinking that a one-dimensional character was bound to disappear if they didn't flesh him out, there was more to the story of Dexter's sudden departure. Kevin Clash, who puppeteered Dexter's head, explained that another performer, Fred Garbo, who also performed Barkley the Dog at the time, did the juggling. While both men were very talented at what they did, actually coordinating the puppeteering and the juggling was next to impossible. Around the same year Labyrinth had come out, and featured a similar trick with Jareth, where juggler Michael Motion would stand behind David Bowie to do the tricks with the orbs. However, basing an entire character around this proved to be too difficult. Clash went so far as to call Dexter Sesame Street's most spectacular failure. Outside of his debut, Dexter would only appear three more times on the show in the next couple episodes. One sketch had him attempt to prove to Susan that he could stop compulsively juggling. Another had him teaching Gordon how to juggle. The final appearance had Dexter in the background of a party doing what else but juggling. After that, he picked up his juggling balls and departed as quickly as he'd arrived. Number 16, Don Music, performed by Richard Hunt. While the creative process can be fun and enriching, it can also be frustrating and headache-inducing. No one knows this better than Don Music, the esteemed songwriter and tortured artist. Don's sketches were all pretty much the same, but it didn't stop them from being entertaining. Typically, Kermit the Frog would be interviewing Don about his work in progress, a song guaranteed to be a hit. If Don could figure out how to end it. The songs would usually be your classics like Mary Had a Little Lamb or Yankee Doodle, although no one ever pointed out to Don that these songs had already been written. Knowing his temperamental, self-destructive tendencies, he probably would have had an aneurysm if he realized this. What is life anyway? <laughs> Anyway, Don would be stuck on the final rhyme and would angrily berate himself and bash his head against the piano. Kermit would work backwards with Don through the song until it was lyrically a different song entirely. For instance, Mary Had a Little Lamb became Mary Had a Bicycle, and the Sesame Street theme itself became a song about finding Yellowstone Park on a stormy night. Appearing from 1974 to 1991, Don Music was a funny character who taught kids about rhyming, and arguably how to get creative when solving a problem. So why was he dropped? Well, when he banged his head against the piano in anguish, apparently kids in the audience would imitate him. As a result, a few later sketches didn't have Don bash his head, at least not as much. But without that aspect, a certain spark was gone, and Don was eventually retired for good. Number 17, Elizabeth, performed by Stephanie DeBruzzo. Elizabeth was best described by her performer. Said Stephanie DeBruzzo, she was a red-headed, pigtailed little girl with a loud, nasal, Queen-slash-Brooklyn-accented voice, who I loved because she was so unlike your typical little girl characters. Elizabeth was introduced in 1997 as the best friend of a little boy named Jerome, who has just moved to Sesame Street and is already missing Elizabeth back home. At the end, Elizabeth visits him. In future episodes, Elizabeth apparently moved to Sesame Street herself, and Jerome is nowhere to be seen. 
Not that an average four-year-old is going to point out continuity issues on the show or anything. That's for weirdos on YouTube like me to do. Despite being charmingly performed, Elizabeth didn't get too much of a chance to develop as a character, outside of her enthusiastic devotion to her adorable kitten, Little Murray Sparkles, performed by Alice Deneen. Elizabeth appeared on a semi-frequent basis in the year 2000, and then kind of faded away. It's always a shame when a likable character vanishes like that, and I certainly wouldn't be opposed to seeing her make a comeback someday. As long as Little Murray Sparkles is there too, of course. Number 18. Ernestine and Brad, performed by David Rudman and Richard Hunt. I'm including these two in one entry, despite them never appearing on screen together to my knowledge. However, they're relatives of everyone's favorite Sesame Street duo, Ernie and Bert, so why not let them share this one? Brad, Bert's nephew, first appeared in 1977. Bert played the role of the proud, doting uncle and happily showed Brad off to everyone a few times on Sesame Street. Cute as Brad is, the only sketch with him available for viewing online is an adorable bit where Ernie helps Bert find Brad some bath toys, before completely going overboard. Brad's reaction to a large shark toy is especially priceless. How about how about a shark to swim? Ah, no, no, it's, to, it's okay. It's okay, play just, shark. Just to pretend. Yeah, just shark pretend. to uh, okay. To Ernestine, meanwhile, is Ernie's cousin, making her debut in 1985. She bears more than a striking resemblance to Ernie, even emulating his laugh. There's a little more Ernestine material available to the public. She's been in a few sketches with Ernie, a song where Olivia tried to take her picture, and the VHS The Best of Ernie and Bert, where she, Gina, and Big Bird looked at Ernie and Bert's photo album. As I said before, Ernestine and Brad never appeared together, which is a real missed opportunity. The cuteness levels would have been off the charts. Oh, and I can't forget to mention Brad's father, Bart. He's a loud, sleazy traveling salesman who needs to be seen to be believed. But I really want to tell you, you must be Ernie. <laughs> well, Ernie, I just came into town by way of Buffalo. But next time, I'll take the train. Wah, 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 wah. Oh, I'm a guest. I really wonder how that kid is going to grow up. Number 19, Farley, performed by Jerry Nelson. What can we say about Farley? Wow, what can we say about Farley? This little green boy was introduced in Season 2, and appeared in many sketches, books, and records, and yet he never really developed anything resembling a personality. For a character that appeared fairly often, you'd think I could find something more to say about him, but I can't. And that's why he's on this list, because it's so strange that Farley was used somewhat regularly in the 70s, and yet I can't really describe his character at all. Unlike Betty Lou, who I talked about previously, there was no real effort ever made to develop Farley whatsoever. After all, Betty Lou was revived from a need to add more gender equality to the street. We already had enough distinct male characters. After the 70s, Farley popped up twice more, once in 1996 and again in 2000. Nothing really came of those appearances, however. It's just an odd little conundrum. What can we say about Farley? Number 20. Forgetful Jones, typically performed by Richard Hunt. Well, we may have not had too much to say about Farley, but Forgetful Jones is another story. Created by the aforementioned writer Norman Stiles, Forgetful Jones is a cowboy who, as his nickname implies, has a lot of trouble remembering things. According to Stiles, Jones was meant to teach kids how to remember something they've forgotten, and to stress that everyone forgets things sometimes. This is why other characters may get frustrated with Forgetful Jones, but they rarely ever get angry at him. Despite forgetting nearly anything and everything all the time, Forgetful had his moments of competence. In one sketch with Louise, Forgetful apparently forgot he spoke English, and it was revealed that he was bilingual, speaking perfect Spanish instead. In another sketch, coincidentally also with Louise, Forgetful revealed that if he wrote something down on a calendar, he was able to remember not only the upcoming event, but also a plethora of minute details. Of course, he probably usually forgets to write things down in the first place, so... Forgetful Jones was introduced in 1980 and performed by Michael Earl. About a year later, Richard Hunt took over. While a character like Forgetful Jones could easily become annoying, it was thanks to Hunt's endearing performance that he was a lovable coot who you couldn't help but want to succeed. Most of the time you're rooting for Forgetful to remember, and happy when he pulls it off with the support of his friends. I should also mention his girlfriend Clementine, performed first by Brian Meal, then Kevin Clash, and finally Camille Bonora, and his horse Buster, performed by Martin P. Robinson. His friends are a great source of support and help to Forgetful, even if they can get a little testy at times, especially Clementine. 
After Hunt's passing in 1992, the character was more or less retired, making only background appearances. In 2019, however, Forgetful Jones made a few small speaking appearances, including at Comic-Con, and a video where he mixes up his and Bert's laundry. Only time will tell if Forgetful Jones will truly remember how to get to Sesame Street and become a recurring character again. Whether he does or not, we'll certainly never forget him. Thank you all for watching part two. I really appreciate the support everyone's been giving these videos. I'm happy that you all like them. I hope you like this part, I hope you like the next part, and so on and so on, and I will see you next time. Oh, yeah, yeah, but what's the name of that song? Um, right, but uh, what's the name of that song? It goes, uh, yeah, something, something, cows, or is it birds? Um, oh, I wish I remembered the words. Ooh. Yeah, but what's the name of that song? I'd like to sing right along You see, I've heard it said With words and music A fella can't go wrong But, um uh, uh, What's the name of that song? Oh, um uh, I, I know I can remember a I really could stop whenever I want <laughs>